what? You spent how much for that projector? Well, the old one died. I needed it for reviews. Plus, it's five grand cheaper than last year's. Well, why didn't you just get one of those Samsungs with those quantum dots? This is a projector and not a TV. Didn't we talk about this in another video? Yeah, 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 yeah. What's going on, guys? Today, we have another home theater upgrade. If you've been following the channel for a while, you may know that my beloved Sony 675 ES projector developed a problem so I've went ahead and upgraded to the replacement model, the 695 ES. You may be wondering what's so different between the two projectors? They look exactly the same. Well, let's unbox it, hook it up, go over some tech specs, and we'll also see what kind of image this thing throws out. But before we get into all that, if you're into audio and video gear like projectors, or if you wanna keep up with the latest in highest quality movies at home, consider hitting that subscribe button for new weekly content. All right, let's get this thing unboxed. Inside, we get some documentation, you know, the manuals and the warranty info. We have the remote control with backlighting, the batteries to power the remote, and the power cord. The 695 ES retails for $10,000. And if you're familiar with Sony's projectors, you'll see that the design has remained the same throughout the past few generations. The unit has a black matte textured finish, so it's highly anti-reflective, which is great if your projector is located out in the open. On the front, you'll see the lens is centrally mounted with the air intake around the perimeter of the lens. On the outer left and right sides, you'll find the air exhaust ports. Having the intake and outtakes up front make placing the projector up against a back wall possible. So if you need that extra inch or two of throw distance, you'll have no problem with the Sony. On the left side, we have inputs for a LAN connection. And one of the biggest features this year is support for full 18 gigabit HDMI inputs. And this is found on both HDMIs. On the 675ES, bandwidth was capped out at 13.5 gigabits. What makes this a big deal is now you can watch 4K HDR 60p content with smoother color gradations. On the 675, there was some noticeable banding. Now besides Billy Lynn's long halftime walk, I'm not aware of any other movies that are shot in 4K 60 with HDR. So these inputs will really benefit gamers out there playing in 4K. On the right side, you'll find controls for power, input selection, menu, the directional control pad, and the lens button. On the back of the unit are two more air intakes on the outer edge of the casing and an IR sensor located top center. On the top is an LED warning indicator and a standby light. The 695 is a pretty heavy unit as well, weighing in at 31 pounds. It's 19 and a half inches wide by nine inches in height by 18 and a quarter inches deep. So you may need a second set of hands if you're ceiling mounting. All right, time for a few tech specs. The projector has a resolution of 4096 by 2160, which is DCI 4K. This is the dominant 4K standard for the movie projection industry. Our televisions at home and many other 4K projectors have a resolution of 3840 by 2160. This is known as 4K UHD, which is used in television and consumer media such as 4K Blu-rays. So with a resolution of 4096, means there will be more usable pixels to the left and right sides of the screen. You will be using these extra pixels when watching 4K Blu-rays or streaming, but they will be useful if your PC is hooked up to it for gaming. So you'll have a slightly wider field of view. As far as brightness, the 695 is rated at 1800 lumens, which is 300 more than their entry level model, the 295 ES. It has the same brightness as the outgoing 675. This has a rated dynamic contrast of 350,000 to one, using a combination of video processing along with a dynamic iris. You might be wondering what a dynamic iris is. Well, as you're watching a movie, if a bright scene is playing, the iris in the lens will be wide open to let more light out. If the scene changes and gets darker, the lens will start to close up and will dim the image, resulting in darker black levels, thus enhancing contrast. For HDR performance, the projector supports HDR10 and HLG. As of right now, there are no consumer projectors that support Dolby Vision, and there doesn't seem to be any news on it coming anytime soon for projectors. Now for all the 3D lovers out there, this does support the 3D format with a built-in 3D transmitter. All you need to do is get some glasses and you're all set. Another big thing for this year is support for IMAX enhanced content. There's not a ton of it out right now, but you'll be covered if the format ever does take off. Now I'm gonna be using this with a panomorph lens and a 235 by one curved screen. So the geometry may be a little off in the video. So if you've ever set up a projector before, it's pretty simple. The hardest part is hanging, then aligning it. I'm not gonna get into mounting it, I'm just gonna go through a few of the setup options and what's new coming from the older model. Now, unlike some lower cost projectors, this one has a motorized lens, which really helps to get the image perfectly centered on the screen. You don't have to mess with dials or knobs or anything like that. Just hit the shift button on the remote 
And as you can see, you can move the image up by 85% or down by 80%. You can move vertically left or right by 31%. So you've got a good range to get the image perfectly centered. Taking a quick look at some of the menu options, we get nine picture presets. I've been using Cinema 1 with a few tweaks as I find it produces the best looking image with natural color and good contrast. If you're familiar with Sony's TVs, you may be familiar with Reality Creation. It tries to add extra detail and sharpness through a database that Sony has curated. I'm not exactly sure how they make it work, but I do know if you turn the slider all the way up high, the image does become overly processed looking. I always keep this one off. Here we have the dynamic iris control. You get three options. Full for a combination of signal processing and aperture control. Limited, which will control the aperture at a slower speed with a slightly less brighter image. Or you can turn it off. Brightness will limit how wide the iris can open. You may want to play around with this if you notice your blacks are grayish with it at max setting. Here's the contrast enhancer, which will artificially enhance black levels, but it can start blowing out highlights and crushing blacks if you have it set too high. I normally keep this off, but sometimes I like to play around with it. And you have lamp control. If you keep it on high, it's noticeably loud, but the image is brighter. Lamp life will be shorter at I think either two or 3000 hours, but don't quote me on that one. And low lamp mode is a lot quieter, but slightly dimmer. Lamp life is rated at 6000 hours set on low. Now being able to use motion flow on 4K sources is new for this year. You couldn't do this on the older model. First one is impulse, which is black frame insertion or BFI. You may notice a slightly dimmer image here and a little bit of flicker. Combination is a combo of motion interpolation and black frame insertion. The image is not supposed to get dimmer when using the setting. Smooth high and smooth low is motion interpolation. One is obviously smoother than the other, and this is basically the soap opera effect, or SOE. True Cinema is supposed to show 24 FPS shot films in their original frame rate. You may want to try these different settings and decide which looks best for you depending on material. That's it for motion enhancement. Now if you're watching HDR content, you'll see the HDR annotation on the contrast slider. You can adjust the intensity here. The higher you go up, the more blown out it looks. Another new feature under advanced settings is the HDR reference mode. You can keep it on auto, which does the auto switching. HDR10, which the manual states is for use with HDR10 content, or HDR reference, which is new and says to be used with HDR content with a max 1000 nit rating. I always thought HDR10 was always max at 1000 nits, so why do we have two modes? But there is two. Now if I switch back and forth, you can see by the arrow, using reference does retain the best highlight detail. And then we have HLG, or you can turn off HDR. Just going through them one more time, reference does look the best with auto having a little bit more color vibrancy, but it also does look a bit more blown out. Now this clip is War for the Planet of the Apes, and it is mastered at 1000 nits. There wasn't a night and day difference with tone mapping using a reference, but if I switch over to Soli, which is mastered at 4000 nits, if you keep your eyes on the flame here with HDR off, there's a ton of detail in this area. Moving up to reference, all that detail is blown out. HDR10 is a little worse, and switching to auto just makes colors pop a bit more. Now I'm playing this through a Panasonic UB9000. If you turn on their HDR optimizer feature, you get a ton of that detail back. So my conclusion is that the tone mapping on the Sony is not the greatest, which makes me curious to see what the new JVCs are bringing to the table this year, since their new 4K projectors will have dynamic HDR built in. So I feel if you own this projector and possibly any other Sony projectors, you may want to look into getting one of these newer Panasonic players to get that extra bit of detail out. To me, it truly makes a difference not only with projectors, but with TVs as well. Backing out of this, you may also want to go into input lag reduction as there is a tiny bit of noise reduction being applied. This can make images look a little bit smoother. Unfortunately, it's so subtle, the camera doesn't pick it up. If you turn reduction on, it will turn off the noise reduction, but by turning it on, you can't use motion flow. So if you're a purist, you may want to keep lag reduction turned on. Oh, and input lag is said to be between 21 to 27 milliseconds. I suppose if you're a gamer, that should be a plus. 
And as far as 3D performance, I thought it was excellent with no crosstalk, just an overall great experience. Okay, so what's so great about this projector and should you upgrade if you have the older 675ES? I'm gonna be honest, I didn't notice a drastic difference between the two models. This is a fresh out of the box projector, so the image did seem brighter and more vibrant. But then again, the older one did have about a thousand hours on the lamp. So there is that chance I didn't notice the image getting dimmer over time. I mean, these lamps are rated at 6,000 hours on low lamp mode, which is what I always use. High lamp is just too loud for my space. It makes me think, did the lamp dim that much in only a thousand hours? Guess I won't know since I didn't have both on hand at the same time. But aside from the image seeming brighter, sharpness and clarity seem the same as well. I haven't went and gotten the projector professionally calibrated yet, but using the Cinema 1 preset, I found the image to look the most natural with a nice warmth overall. Sitting about six to seven feet away in my first row of seating, I saw zero pixels. And this is with a 125 inch screen. Detail as you'd expect is ultra sharp. And with this much screen real estate, this is where I feel the added resolution of 4K really shines. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this does have native 4K resolution. So it's not a 1080p projector that uses pixel shifting to achieve a 4K image. If you're unfamiliar with pixel shifting, it essentially takes the 1080 pixels and kind of splits them or doubles them to get twice as many pixels on screen. Some people can't tell a difference from certain viewing distances, but having owned JVC projectors in the past with their E-Shift 4K upscaling, myself and the rest of the spare change crew could definitely see a smoother, sharper, more cleaner image with a native 4K projected image. So if you're watching other YouTube videos about budget 4K projectors, just keep in mind they're likely only 1080p projectors with upscaling. Okay, with that being said, as far as HDR performance, projector users know that a top quality LED TV is gonna be a whole lot brighter and provide those extremely bright spectral highlights without much issue. Now, since I have a pitch black room with black walls and a black ceiling, the perception of brightness is heightened. When those peak highlights do appear, it's in such a large grander scale that all the light that reflects back at your eyes will seem extremely bright. And if you're squinting at your TV screen, you may find yourself looking away with a much larger image. My screen has a 1.0 gain, so I can imagine how bright an image would be with a much higher gain screen. And as far as color reproduction is concerned, I find that top tier projectors will rival even the best LED or OLED sets out there. Black levels, on the other hand, won't be touching an OLED's blacks, but since the 695 does have a dynamic iris, you will get excellent contrast and amazing three-dimensional pop with high quality sources. One thing I do wanna mention again, having owned the 675 for the past two years with a fixed anamorphic lens, there was no way to stretch the image to fit a cinema scope screen with the lens in place. Your only option was either to shell out big bucks for a video processor like a Lumigen, or if you were fortunate enough to buy an Oppo, they did include a 21 by nine option in their last 4K players to do the stretching. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll leave a link to a video that explains what it does in the description. So on this year's model, if you have a fixed lens in place, Sony now allows you to vertically stretch a 4K image. The older model only lets you stretch a 1080p image. So everyone with a fixed lens, you can now move away from your Oppo players. I did mention earlier that these new 2019 models will support the full 18 gigabit HDMI bandwidth. So gaming with 4K HDR at 60 frames per second should be no problem. I didn't test any gaming on the projector because I feel at this price this thing cost, I wouldn't want to waste lamp life on playing games for hours, but that's just my personal preference. Another big or maybe not so big feature this supports is IMAX Enhanced. When playing back an IMAX Enhanced disc, I didn't notice any kind of special preset that it kicked into. So as far as it doing something special with IMAX encoded content, I guess it just means it looks nice. Now I'm not a professional display reviewer or a professional calibrator, so I wasn't able to take any measurements. I'm just a professional home theater enthusiast. And my final thought on the 695 is that it throws an amazing image with either 1080p or 4K HDR content. 1080p pixel shifting projectors, eh. I saw no visible banding issues, colors were reproduced out of the box realistically, and HDR to my eyes was excellent. The option to stretch 4K content with the fixed lens in place I find is a major bonus, and it's all backed up with a three year warranty. Now, if you've got the spare change and wanna up your home theater game and put those OLEDs and quantum dots on the back burner, I think the 695 or any true 4K projector needs to be on your short list. Well, that's all I've got for now. If there's something that we've missed or you want us to cover something else about the projector, let us know in the comments down below. Follow us on social media. And if you wanna support the channel, stop by our Patreon page. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you guys again in the next video.